Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this another Lord's day that thou hast given us. We thank thee for thy manifold blessings to us, all of which come to us through the Lord Jesus Christ, who came that we might have life and might have it more abundantly. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. And yet the Lord Jesus has come for the precise opposite reason. He's come that we might have, in other words, to give. Not only to give, but to give life and to give it more abundantly. So we thank thee for the life that thou hast given us through the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank thee that thou dost not only regenerate us, but we are in the process of sanctification, dying more and more to sin, living more and more into righteousness, and that we shall be, as we shall see, Lord willing, in a few minutes, we shall be finally delivered, not only from the guilt of sin, not only from the power and pollution of sin, but finally from the very presence of sin, which is our blessed hope. And we thank thee that thou hast sanctified this day unto thyself, one day in seven, and not only so, but has sanctified it unto the benefit of thy people. So we pray that thou wouldst enlighten us this day. Thou wouldst teach us through thy spirit, which has been given us to guide us into all truth. We pray for those true ministers of the gospel this day, that they would preach not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and a power. That thou wouldst raise up more men to stand for the truth and against the lie, and that we would see a great multitude, which no man can number, because we know that the multitude results always in the same way it's always resulted in, in the line of continued generations. So be with us this day and cause us to understand and believe. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. We're looking at Hebrews 11. Verses 28 and 29, we've been talking about Moses and the faith of Moses. And Moses' faith is not merely Moses' faith, but Moses' faith is your faith. Verse 28, through faith, Moses kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Verse 29, by faith, they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians, a saying to do, were drowned. Last week in verse 28, we saw once again yet another statement of the gospel, did we not? And we are frequently and more frequently seeing the gospel everywhere. As we said before, if the main theme of Scripture is the gospel, then how could you not see it everywhere? As we frequently quote 2 Corinthians 4, 6, which says, I hope you've memorized that verse, by the way, for God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And we said that this verse tells us, among other things, that when a person becomes a Christian, to give the light, to give light, which is understanding. How do I know that? Because it says the light of the knowledge. But the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. When a person becomes a Christian, he sees for the first time. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 clearly tells us that it is not he himself, but God, that is to be glorified. That is a wonderful, wondrous description of a Christian. And in fact, yesterday, did we not see the same thing? In Deuteronomy, let's look at it again. Deuteronomy 28, 58. Notice carefully the parallel between this verse and 2 Corinthians 4, 6. 
Deuteronomy 28, 58. If thou wilt not observe to do all the words of this law that are written in this book, that thou mayest fear this glorious and fearful name, the Lord thy God, then, he says, if thou wilt not observe to do all the words of this law, then the Lord will make thy plagues wonderful, which means fantastically awful, and the plagues of thy seed. See the, you see the, you see the uh, covenant there. Not only you, and the plagues visiting the iniquities of the Father under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Remember, second commandment. The Lord will make thy plagues wonderful and the plagues of thy seed, even great plagues and of long continuance and sore sicknesses and of long continuance. But verse 58, isn't this so interesting that it's telling us that in a certain sense, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments are given us for the purpose do all the words of this law that are written in this book that thou mayest fear this glorious and fearful name, the Lord thy God. There it is. The third commandment. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. The holy and reverent use of God's names, titles, attributes, ordinances, word and works. The law is given in a real sense so that we may fear this glorious and fearful name. Notice the word glorious. To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And this word, which is in the Hebrew, the root meaning of which is, we've been told on a number of occasions, I'm sure you've heard it. It's weight. The glory of God. To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. And I was thinking of the story, remember in the Old Testament where the Philistines defeated the Israelites and Eli's daughter-in-law was in the process of giving birth to a son. And the text tells us when she heard that her uh, husband had died and most uh, especially when she heard that the ark of God had been taken by the Philistines. She died and gave birth, but before dying, she named her son Ichabod. And the word right here in the passage we just read, Deuteronomy 28, 58. The glorious and fearful name is Kabod. She named her son Ichabod. Meaning literally, no glory. Meaning what? The ark of God represented the presence of God. And the presence of God is the glory of God. No glory. Since the ark was taken. Once again, this word glory means weight. It means significance. And to use the word in our text in the very first verse of the 11th chapter. Now faith is the substance. God is the weight of everything. He's the significance of everything. He's the substance of everything. And without God, there is no substance. There is no significance. There is no weight. Oh, that's a very weighty thing to say. Yeah. Because God is the glory. The purpose of the commandments is so that you will know this one thing. And 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. It doesn't stop right there. In the face of Jesus Christ, you see no glory of God without Christ. Let's not forget what we're talking about. This is a description of a Christian who sees for the first time in his life, when he becomes a Christian, that it is God and not self, that he's to be glorified. And we must add what we just did that, to see the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Because without seeing... 
Christ. There is no seeing the glory of God. And that we see this concept of the text tells us the glory of God not only objectively, that God is the glory. You see that? That thou mayest fear this glorious and fearful name, the Lord. Objectively speaking, but also subjectively speaking, because it says, the Lord, thy God. Which we've been saying over and over again. And we see with full, we say with full confidence this because it is He that has caused us. Then look at uh, Exodus, listen, listen to this. Exodus 15. What's the, what's the uh, context of this? Exodus 15 11. Who is like unto thee, O Lord? What is the name of God? Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like unto thee? Glorious. There it is. In holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders. What's the context? The song of Moses. Once again. And last week. So what we're saying is that a wonderful description of a Christian is one who sees for the first time that it is God it's God the Father's will, and not your will. It's God the Son's work, and not your work. It's God the Spirit's regeneration that produces your faith. And yet, last week we saw another description, wonderful, just as beautiful description of a Christian. Not only one who realizes for the first time that it is God is to be glorified, but, and aren't these descriptions Wonderful. As we're, our working definition of a Christian tells us, um, these all died in faith, not having seen the promises, but having, not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. And why do these descriptions of a Christian encourage you so much? Here's why. Because if you can say that you believe, that you realize that it is God and not you who's to be glorified, then you realize that you didn't come up with this on your own. Secondly, perhaps more importantly, not only did you not come up with this on your own, but this idea is salvation. See it? To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. That is salvation. Glorifying God. Change from glory into glory. Till in heaven we take our place. Till we cast our crowns before the lost in wonder, love, and praise. So, we see once again another description of a Christian. Um, and that is the idea that is spoken of in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 10 and 11. And with all the feebleness, let's look at that. 2 Corinthians 2, 10 and 11, wonderful, which is what we were talking about all of last week. This description of a Christian. And with all the feebleness, 2 Thessalonians 2, 10, of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And just as important as 2 Corinthians 4, 6, which tells you that you're a Christian, if you do see that it is God who is to be glorified, this passage, um, all the seed will son righteous in them because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. So this is once again a great encouragement to the Christian because if you realize that you love the truth, you didn't come up with that on your own. You loved the lie from birth. What is the truth? Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth. 
Not a truth. And the truth shall make you free. The truth is Christ's righteousness. The lie. Self-righteousness once again. So, if you realize that you love the truth instead of the lie, then you can be confident that this understanding, this realization has been given to you of God for the purpose of saving you. What an encouragement. And in case you thought my explanation last week of Hebrews 11, 28 and 29 was a perfect description of the gospel. Let's review it once again. Because we see all five points in these two verses. First of all, we said, the death of the Lamb not only tells you something about Christ, but it tells you something, the wages of sin is death. It tells you what you deserve. We said the gospel from a certain standpoint is the person, that, not only the work of Christ, but the person of Christ, necessitated by not only the work of the sinner, not only because of your individual transgressions, but because of what your individual transgressions tell you about you, the person and work of Christ, owing to not only the work of the sinner, but the person of the sinner, which is what Moses saw in the death of the Lamb. Psalm 711 says, God, notice carefully, God judges the righteous and God is angry with the wicked, not the wicked sins only. God is angry with the wicked every day, the person of the sinner. Or maybe even clearer, John 336, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him, the death of the Lamb, which is what Moses saw. And then secondly, um, not only the death of the Lamb, but he saw, which is total depravity, the breath of God abideth on you. He saw also in God's command to keep the Passover, and notice carefully, don't forget this part. Who did God command to keep the path? Only the Israelites. You see it? Unconditional election. Not the Egyptians. That thou mightest know that. Remember, don't forget our verse, and we're going to look at it again in a second. Ezekiel eleven seven. That they might, that you might know that it is God that maketh the difference. God who commanded the Israelites to keep the Passover. Which is what Moses saw, unconditional election. And then, he saw in the, oh, I was going to say one other thing. We saw the same thing, did we not? What is the preface of the Ten Commandments? I am the Lord thy God. The same exact thing. The same thing that Moses saw. I am the Lord thy God, which had brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. We said, I am the Lord. God is the Spirit. Infinite, eternal, and changeable. Being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth, all of which attributes condemn you. Thy God. Condemnation, total depravity. Thy God. Unconditional election. Which have brought thee the blood of the Lamb. And then the next thing. Brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Irresistible grace. And so we see. Thirdly, what Moses saw. Let's look up, as we just said, let's look back at this. is such a wonderful verse. How could we not look back at it? Exodus 11, 7. In the middle of the verse. That ye may know how that the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. First of all, we just said, the Lord puts a difference. Unconditional election. He commanded them to keep the Passover. But notice carefully the word how. They I mean, you know how the Lord makes a difference. The blood of the Lamb. Blood sprinkled over the doorpost.
which is still the case. It's the blood that makes the difference. Remember I told you recently that I have yet to find a person. Does this amaze you? I have yet to find a person in this country of 1,500,000,000 people who knows what the number 2019 means. Why do you know it? You not only know it superficially, but you know it is Christ that makes a difference. The blood of Christ that makes a difference. Philip Schaff, it's been a quite a while before we mentioned this. I mean, since we mentioned this. Some of you probably never heard it, heard me say it before, but I was reading in Philip Schaff's History of the Christian Church, he made this phenomenal statement. He said that the Christian Reformation is the second most important event in his, not Christian history, in human history. But notice, he not only said that, he said, next to the incarnation, it's the second most important event in Christian history. So we're not only told number two, we're also told number one in the same statement. And number one is the incarnation because it, it was Christ that came. And he came to die. It is Christ that maketh the difference. And then fourthly, not only the ill in Tulip, the blood sprinkled over the doorposts. How that God makes a difference. But we can't stop at that because we are going from glory to glory. And now the, the work of the Father in election, the work of the Son in redemption, it is Christ's blood and Christ's blood alone that you may know how God makes a difference. And then the fourth point, did you notice in Ezekiel, excuse me, in Exodus eleven seven, it says that ye may know, that ye may know, there it is, it, not only how God, not only God makes a difference, not only how he makes a difference, but he may know. That's the fourth letter. That's the I. Irresistible grace. As we said last week, how does that correspond to our text? That Moses kept the Passover through faith. In other words, he kept the Passover knowingly. So, through faith, Moses kept the Passover. Through knowing, number one, the problem of total depravity. Secondly, through knowing the Father's solution in election. Did God leave all mankind to perish? There it is. Number 20. Did God leave all mankind to perish in the estate of sin and misery? God having, out of his mere good pleasure from all eternity, elected some to everlasting life. There it is. N Moses knew the problem in the death of the Lamb. No, Moses knew the Father's solution in election. Moses knew, how well did he know this? We don't know. But he knew these things because he kept the Passover in faith. He knew the Son's solution in the death of the Lamb, the sprinkling of the blood. And he knew the Spirit's solution. The Son's solution, John 1, 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. The Son's solution. And then the Spirit's solution. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So, the Son's solution, justification, the spirit solution, sanctification. They went, verse 29 tells us, by faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land. Not only justification, seeing the blood of the Lamb, but also sanctification, passing through the Red Sea as by dry land. For, another, for other foundation, 1 Corinthians 3 tells us, can no man lay then that is laid, which is Jesus Christ, the salvation, the, the foundation for our sanctification. And then finally, let's look at Numbers 27, 12, and 13, what Moses saw.
Numbers 27, 12, and 13. And the Lord said unto Moses, Get thee up into this Mount Aberrant, and see the land, and see the land which I have given unto the children of Israel. And when thou hast seen it, thou also shalt be gathered unto thy people as Aaron thy brother was gathered. Interesting. Um, this is another metaphor for Christ not only justifying us faith we're justified through faith. We're sanctified through faith. And then finally, we're glorified through faith. And did you notice the words of God to Moses in verse 13? Is this amazing or is this amazing? And when, it doesn't say after. And when thou hast seen it, thou shalt also be gathered. Apparently, think about meditate on it. Apparently, as soon as Moses saw the land, he died. He was gathered to his people. Which is a metaphor for what? Glorification. Amazing. By faith, Moses saw the blood. By faith, by faith justification. By faith, Moses saw the dry land under his feet. Through the Red Sea, sanctification. And by faith, Moses saw the land of Canaan. We're going to talk about that in a second. It's interesting. Well, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. First, let's look first of all. 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Meditate on the fact today that Moses didn't go into the land. Think about the significance of that. 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Now all these things happen unto them for examples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Not only Moses' admonition, but our admonition. Moses did not enter as we no, the land of Canaan because he struck the rock instead of speaking to the rock. And this was a type of admonition to Moses. If you look up that word admonition in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, it, from a certain standpoint, we could say it was a, it was a wake up call. Where's admonition? From a certain standpoint, Moses did not enter the land of Canaan because, as we're told in the first part of verse 28, by faith he kept the Passover. Moses keeping the Passover, including his understanding of justification, the blood of the lamb, his understanding of sanctification, the, the land under his feet going through the Red Sea, and then finally, his understanding of glorification. He kept the Passover by faith because it wasn't a ritual to him, but it was a reality. Psalm 40, we looked at. Sacrifice and offering. Thou didst not desire. Burn offering and sin offering. Hast thou not required. Then said I, Lo, I come in the bottom of the book it is written of me. He saw Christ. Moses saw his death in the Lamb. Moses saw the Father's election. Moses saw also glorification. Let's look at Isaiah 63, 12. Look at this. That led them. God led them by the right hand of Moses. 
with his glorious arm, dividing the water before them to make himself an everlasting name. Moses saw that it wasn't his arm because it says they led them by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm dividing the water before him. And think about this. Moses was kept from seeing the land physically, standing on it and seeing it. He saw it from a distance. Perhaps, should we even use the word insisting that, he didn't see the land physically so that he would see the spiritual sight of the land. Amazing, isn't it? So you think you, 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 we're disturbed at sometimes. Well, why did God keep Moses out of the land of Canaan just for striking the rock? And, and it disturbs us from a certain standpoint. From an, another standpoint, though, though Moses was disturbed at it at first, finally he wasn't disturbed at it because he saw what we're, what we're talking about right now. He was kept out of the land so that he would see the land. A recent application in our midst. We see that it is God who, who maketh us to differ through faith. The recent bickering, the recent slander in our midst, the recent eisegesis imposing the word only onto the text of 1 John 3.18 when it's not there. The recent name calling. Why was it these people and not you? Calling someone an egomaniac. Every single Christian. What is the main quality of a Christian? One of the main qualities. Humility. So it was God. They went out from us. Can we keep from quoting this verse? 1 John 2, 18, they went out from us, but they were not all of us. For, they have, for if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be manifest that they were not all of us. Think of, think of the glorious nature of the fellowship that we have. And you're going to separate yourself from us. No, because of faith. God caused Moses to see these things by faith. And God causes you to see these things. Back to our text. Our second text. Our first one. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. You are a Christian because you see for the first time that it is God to be glorified. 2 Thessalonians 2, 10. All the seed will son righteousness in them because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. If you love the truth, you will see the truth. And the fact that you're, you see the truth is because you're looking for the truth. And you're looking, let me tell you this, you're looking for the truth because you found it. And you see it everywhere. Recently online, I asked somebody, asked some people, what's the most important religious question? And they couldn't come up with it. And I told them what the most important religious question was. And did they thank me? No. It's not important. You look for the truth. You look for the gospel. They receive not the love of the truth that they might be. So God saves you by giving you love of the truth. And if you love the truth, you find the truth. You see it everywhere. More and more and more you see it. You see it. You see the most important religious question, do you not? In Job 25, 4. How then? Through the proclamation of the law. Can a man be just with God? You see it in Job 14, 4, do you not? Which says, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? And you must be clean. You must be clean, number one. Secondly, you're the essence of filth. 
That's the most important religious question. You see it. You see it in Psalm 133 and 4. You see the gospel. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, and thou shalt, being a just God, O Lord, who can stand? But there is forgiveness with thee. You see it in the warm and fuzzy word that we hear constantly at the end of December. Emmanuel. You see what that word really means. It's the most important religious question. How can El, how can the judge of all the earth, El at the end of the word, be imminent? How can the transcendent God, not transcendent only because, think of, then think of this. I don't think we've mentioned this before. We said that God is transcendent. Not only owing to the fact that He is the Creator and we're the Createe. How can you be a part of God since He created you? You being outside of Himself. But most importantly, God is transcendent because of His holiness. Because of the second creation, you see it. How can God have anything to do with you? Most important religious question. The L at the end of Emmanuel. And the answer is that God can be imminent. The transcendent God owing to His holiness. He can be imminent in Emmanuel, the Lord Jesus Christ. We see it in Romans 3.19. Look at it. So turn to Romans 3.19. We're talking about receive the love of the, receiving the love of the truth. You see it everywhere. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. The purpose of the law, the first use of the law. What did we talk about yesterday? Remember? In the third commandment? I asked for the second or third or fourth time. What's the first thing you see in the third commandment? That you've never kept it. That every mouth may be stopped. There it is again. What does that mean? The most important religious question. That every mouth may be stopped. Oh, how can I? What is, what is the flap? The flap jaw. There it is again. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. The flap jaw expression. You know, all this stuff. Yeah. Every mouth may be stopped. I'm a good person. And all the world may become guilty before God. You see the gospel. And finally, you see the gospel. Amazingly, I say with sarcasm. You see the gospel amazingly in the place where you would most expect to see it if you're looking for it. And most people don't see it there. Let me say that again. You see, by the grace of God, by faith, you see the gospel in the place where you would most expect to see it, though nobody else even sees it there. We talked about this. Where would you most expect to see the gospel? You've got the Bible divided into two halves, right? Two parts. Old Testament... New Testament. Where would you most expect to see the gospel? When the New Testament, as we just said, the most important event in human history is the incarnation. That's the New Testament. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him and without Him. It was not anything made that was made. We could say that, John, that the Gospel of John is the first book of the New Testament because you got four Gospels. And then the 14th verse. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. There it is, the Incarnation, the most important event in human history, which comes right after the Old Testament. Where would you most expect to see the Gospel? Where do you see it? In the place where you would most expect to see it. Just like when you get to be about my age, you'll be looking for your keys sometimes. And guess what? They're hanging up on the rack. <laughs> the place <laughs> the place where you would most expect to see them oh you found them there and so it is in scripture 
you see the gospel in the last book, in the last chapter, in the last verse of the Old Testament, which tells us, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. God doesn't strike dirt with a curse. He doesn't strike telephone poles. He doesn't strike mountains. He strikes people like you with a curse. You see it? Most important religious question. How can God not strike you with a curse? Seeing that you are the curse that you are. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. The incarnation of Christ. And two weeks ago, we mentioned, did we not, that the gospel sometimes occurs in a broad sense, the gospel in a broad sense, the gospel in a narrow sense. We said the gospel in the broad sense of the term is the law and the gospel. Remember we said that? The gospel in a broad sense of the term includes the most important religious question. And the gospel, in the narrow sense of the term, what shall I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel, in the narrow sense, assumes the most important religious question. But the most important religious question is always there as we tried to see it a few minutes ago. Job 25, 4. Job 14, 4. Psalm 130, verses 3 and 4. The word Emmanuel the introduction, the preface to the Ten Commandments. How about the very beginning of the Ten Commandments? After the preface, God spake, Elohim spake all these words, saying, I am Jehovah. That's the gospel. How can Elohim be Jehovah? And then last week, we spoke finally at the end of the covenant. Moses, because the title of the sermon was He and Them. Through faith He kept the Passover, lest He that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. The covenant. You keep the Passover we set up here. You fathers especially because Moses was a father to the Israelites. You keep the Passover up here, but you don't keep it merely for yourself. You keep it for them. Those that you represent. Those in your family that you're a father to. Yeah, the homeschool mom. They can, they can teach the children to memorize, but it's incumbent upon you to keep the Passover for your children, to inculcate the truth to them. But now today, as I said yesterday, the title of this message, I believe, is going to be last week was He and Them. This week, it's Them and They. Verse 28. Lest He that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Verse 29. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea. The them and the they. So now we're going to stop and consider one of the most frightful things that a person can ever contemplate. The they and the them. The them and the they. And it also has its counterpart in the natural realm. I think of this song that I heard way back. Carried your books from school. Playing make-believe you're married to me. You were fifth grade, I was sixth. When we came to be walking home every day. Over Bonnycut Bridge and Bay. Till, you, till we grew into. Listen to this. Till we grew into the me and you. Who went our separate ways. And then a minute later come. The riveting words of the song. So close. So close. 
You see it? So close, so close, and yet so far. <clears throat> the them and the day. And this is what we must consider in our text today. Last week, if you looked at sermon audio, you noticed that the title of the sermon was He and Them, referring to the word He in verse 28, and the Them. He at the beginning of the verse, the them at the end of the verse. Moses was a representative, as we just said. As all of you fathers are representatives. But today we want to look at the them in verse 28 and the they in verse 29. Last week, he and them. This week, them and they. Lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. And then... By faith, they passed through the Red Sea. Some of the most interesting movies, though I don't watch many movies, are they're interesting because frequently there's a story within a story. You notice that? That's what makes them interesting. There's a story inside the story. So you've got to pay closer attention. And that is exactly what we have here. A story within a story. The main story is the antithesis, as we've seen, between the Israelites and the Egyptians. If you understand the blood, you know that it is the blood of Christ and the blood of Christ alone that makes a difference between the elect and the reprobate. Well, then, what's the other story? The other story is what we're going to call the them and the they. Lest he that destroy, and catch that word destroy, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they not only were kept from the physical destruction of the Egyptians by putting blood on their doorposts, by faith they passed through the Red Sea. But the frightening thing is that this entire story has nothing whatsoever to do with physical deliverance from anything. Because just as Romans 9, 6 tells us, they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. There's an Israel within Israel. But perhaps even more frightening is the fact that there is a faith within faith. Baptists have hideous theology because Baptists can't see the forest for the trees. And think about this. Perhaps Baptists are a metaphor. Think this thought for a second. Perhaps Baptists are a metaphor for all unbelief. So close. So close and yet so far. Individual persons. Individual churches. Individual doctrines, but no Bible. Somebody tried to refute the post I put up on Hebrews 10, 28 and 29. Count of the blood of the covenant. They counted the blood of the covenant. Wherewith they were sanctified. An unholy thing. They were sanctified by the blood of the covenant. The Israelites were sanctified by the blood over the doorpost. How the Lord maketh a difference between Israel and Egypt. How is that true to say that unbelievers are sanctified? You can't understand it if you're a Baptist. You cannot possibly understand it. And so the person that tried to refute me he, he tried to refute me from a verse, from a scripture, but not from the Bible. See what I'm saying? But they're Presbyterian Baptists as well. What delivered the Israelites from physical death? Think about this. Faith. It was a type of faith that caused them 
to sprinkle the blood over the doorpost. It was a type of faith that caused him to go on dry land through the Red Sea. Faith is believing the word of God. How did they know they were supposed to sprinkle the blood? Because God said so. So what did they do? They did it through faith. A type of faith. Would any of the firstborn been saved, have been saved without the blood on the doorpost? No. But they were all delivered. And they were delivered through a type of faith. But we have reason to believe that nearly all of these people who sprinkled the blood over the doorpost were not delivered from the calamity of which the death angel was a mere metaphor. And here's what makes it especially frightening. These Israelites who finally perished and went to hell Yes, they went to hell because they missed the blood. Think about this though. They missed the blood because of the blood. They missed the forest for the trees. People today. The they missed the baptism today in our day. They missed the baptism because of the baptism. Because of the water. They miss the Lord's Supper because they keep it once a week or they keep it once, once a month. And they miss it because they keep it. They miss everything because they see nothing in the everything. You seek me, the Lord said. The frightening words. When they said, oh, how did you get over here? Because there was only one boat and the disciples went in that boat. So how did you get? You seek me. And they did. Is it coming into focus? You seek me. And you go to the hottest place in hell because you seek me. You're a lamb killing and blood sprinkling. Don't deliver you from the Egyptians. But they give the, Egypt, they give the Egyptians a dictionary definition of what a, an Egyptian really is. As we said before, darkness is a mere metaphor. Back to 2 Corinthians 4, 6. God who commanded the light to shine out of the darkness that shine in our hearts. Your darkness is a metaphor for you from birth. As we said before, darkness depends on you to know what it is. The tragedy of tragedies is what we see before our eyes in the text. The tragedy of tragedies is to be delivered from the death angel in order to go to hell. Think, people of God. What a metaphor Moses is. Moses was kept. Listen to this. Moses was kept out of Canaan so that he would go to Canaan. Up here. But the visible church today as the Israelites in our text are being delivered by the death angel so that they will go to hell lest he that destroyed the firstborn. Listen to the words of the text. Lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. And it's a real possibility. And then the next verse. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea. Oh yeah, they passed through the Red Sea. Them and the they. There is a faith within a faith. And think of this one. There is a Judas as well as a Peter. See it? Peter denied the Lord three times. But he wasn't a Judas. 
So close Judas was. So close, so close, and yet so far. So close Judas was. So close. And so far Peter seemed to be. At the time, right? So far away he seemed to be when he denied the Lord three times. But yet he was right there. And how dare you use Christ asking Peter, lovest thou me? As an excuse for this flap jaw love. Did you see the post? Peter answering, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. Using that as support for ignorant people going around 24-7 saying, I love you. Don't you see the reality? Peter was, remember the, the other text. He was the prime I love you guy. Matthew 26. Let's look at it. Peter got straightened out. The very text that most condemns this position they want to use to support it. Matthew 26, 33. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. I love you, Jesus. That's Peter. And then let's look at John 21, 15. The words of our Lord to Peter. So when they had did not, so when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than that? You think these words drop down out of the sky? That's referencing what Peter said before. He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. No flap jaw love. He got delivered from it. Christ is saying, Peter, you used to be a flap jaw love, Peter. Did you listen to the Imperial song I posted? Did you listen to that? Christ means more to me than you'll ever know. Christ means more to me than I could possibly show. The opposite of the truth. The Christian, oh yes, number one. The Christian knows that he loves Christ because his spirit bears witness with our spirit. We know we love Christ. Secondly, the Christian is amazed at how little he loves compared to how much he ought to love Christ. In other words, the Christian, the Christian is not confident in his love. You see it? As Peter used to be. Them and they. A people within a people. Them and they. A faith within a faith. All the Israelites had a type of faith, else they wouldn't put any blood over the door. But did they, like Moses, understand and love the truth? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this word. Thank Thee for the reality that Thou hast saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to thine own purpose and grace which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. We thank thee that thou hast given us and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth 
that they might be saved. We thank you that thou hast given us a love of the truth, and therefore we do see it everywhere. At the one and the same time, what a frightening thing. And for this cause, that they receive not the love of the truth, that they're characterized by bickering, slandering, backstabbing, eisegeting of a text, going out from us, because they were not ever of us. For this cause, cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. We thank thee that thou hast granted us the love of the truth instead of the strong delusion that we see about us everywhere. In the name of the Lord Jesus we pray. Amen.